Hello and welcome to Encore, coming up in today's film show. From all the fun of the farm to the bright lights of the big city, we check in with Sean the Sheep as the Aardman animator's latest caper hits the big screen. Irene Nemirovsky's wartime novel Sweet Francaise gets the Hollywood treatment, with Kristen Scott Thomas and Michelle Williams starring as women caught up in the German occupation of France. And we check out new French thriller A Perfect Man as fresh-faced actor Pierre Ninet shows his dark side as a writer who finds himself out of his depth. For all that, we're joined by critic Lisa Nesselson, so let's get started. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> now, we're starting with Shaun the Sheep, of course. This is from the same studio as the much-loved Wallace and Gromit Chicken Run. They were family films, perhaps targeted at a younger audience. Does this one, Shaun the Sheep, work for adults too? Uh, this absolutely splendid film is suitable for children, uh, but there is plenty of stuff, in fact, wall to wall, to keep adults in stitches. I've seen it twice, and I have to say my involuntary grin muscles and my dimples got sore both times. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, I think it's a comic masterpiece, but you needn't take my word for it, because I happen to have here a panel of absolutely randomly selected, completely impartial moviegoers who think that you should... <clears throat> flock to see it. Uh, they say that God created Adam from a lump of clay and after all these years it's kind of hard to assess whether the supreme being did a particularly good job but if you put some clay in the hands of the genius animators at the Ardman Studios in Bristol England I think they give the Garden of Eden a run for its money. Now Sean the Sheep movie co-directors Mark Burton and Richard Starzak came to Paris for the opening of the wonderful Ardman retrospective which is taking place through the end of the summer at the uh, Art Ludique Museum and I got to ask them how they were react if anyone dares to suggest that animation is just for children. Let's watch. Some of the most successful films, you know, the last, well, of, of all the movie history have been animated films, right back to Disney films and to more recently with even, say, Frozen, you know, in terms of uh, in financial terms, but also artistically as well, they can be up there with, with live action greats. So. Um, I think uh, more and more, you know, um, people in animation don't think of themselves as doing things for kids. We, you know, we see ourselves as making films that we want to see. And by the same token, if someone suggests that it's undignified work for growing men and women, what? Well, that's true. Well, it's absolutely <laughs> true. Yes, it's, it's slightly embarrassing that we have such a good time laughing at fart jokes, but uh, <laughs> and then get paid at the end. And, and get paid at the end. I feel guilty about it sometimes, but there you go. Well, they've certainly sold it to me. <laughs> OK, but this film, we know that sheep aren't the most talkative of animals, and apparently there's no dialogue whatsoever. Uh, that's absolutely true, but as you say, sheep don't say much, but Sean and his pals from Mossy Bottom Farm managed to be incredibly eloquent all the same through their furry body language, and the sound effects and the musical score literally could not be better. Now, statistics on uh, cows and methane gas are often cited. I don't know how much of global warming can be attributed to internal combustion in sheep, but in this movie, at least, there are some hearty laughs to be had as a direct result of clay critters passing gas, uh, or some questionable restaurant behavior as the sheep in disguise try to fit in. Let's take a look. Okay, so there's certainly plenty of comedy there, but does the film have a plot? Uh, it does. It has a beginning, a middle, and end. They're all terrific. I won't give too much away, but uh, the animals on the farm want a break from routine. Things go terribly wrong. They end up uh, with the farmer who has amnesia in a big city, very much like London. They have to go and try and rescue him, while uh, the equivalent of a dog catcher is also on their tail. Uh, and remember to stay until the very end of the credits. Okay, looks like a lot of fun, that one. Next, we're moving on to Suite Francaise. Now, this is Irene. 
Ivan Nemirovsky's novel. It was written in 1942, but only published some 50 years, 60 years after her death, when she, she died in a concentration camp. Now, the book was critically acclaimed across the board. Um, that's quite something to live up to. Has director Sal Dib managed to do it justice? Well, the novel is brilliant. That's not a word I bandy about, but it is brilliant. It's an involving, unflinching look at the assortment of French characters that she came up with during the exodus from Paris when the Germans arrived. Uh, and it's combined with a riveting account of what happens when a widow played with haughty, uh, haughty, haughty, haughty resolve by uh, Kristen Scott Thomas and uh, her daughter-in-law Lucille, played by Michelle Williams with an English accent, are obliged to house a German officer in their house in a provincial village. The officer is beautifully played by Belgian actor Matthias Schoenhartz and he's pretty darn likable as Nazis go. Uh, so this film is an adaptation of the second section of what Nemirovsky hoped would be five long chapters, but before she could revise those two sections and incorporate her notes, which revealed that she wanted the story to be very much like a film. She makes references to that. She was arrested and deported to Auschwitz, where she died in 1942. Incredibly, her two daughters survived the war. One of them kept the manuscript, couldn't bear to look at it for decades and decades, but when she did and read it, realized it was more than suitable for uh, publication. It's been translated. If you read French, I urge you to read the original. If not, it's, it's very good in English. And they've also, just this January, made a graphic novel out of part one. Um, well, as you say, you know, the daughter here was, was instrumental in getting this novel published. Now, we can hear from her speaking about the film itself and the director of the film. Let's take a look. Here was this incredible story that was unfolding. Um, in front of me in the way that it unfolded in front of Iren that she was writing a story about events that were happening around her. It felt very exciting. My mother always had this object in her hands. I remember even in my earliest memories. I think I must have opened the book for the first time in the 60s or 70s, and I felt straight away the pain in the writing. I saw the perspective she had, what she understood of the situation. But there was nothing to be done. Well, given the background and the context to this film, it's, it's obviously a very difficult challenge to undertake. Uh, how does the film stand up? Well, I was worried at first by the sort of stodgy voiceover narration, but the film and the romance at its heart really does pick up steam as it goes along. And it's a story of how, in the end, uh, war brings out the best and the worst in people here, mostly the worst. Uh, it mostly lacks the hard-nosed, incredibly prescient edge of the unfinished novel. And the screenplay takes some liberties with the book, uh, especially toward the end. But it's still watchable and pleasantly melancholy. Let's take a look. The officer that lives here. I don't speak to him. That's not what I've heard. Can I play you something? This German is our enemy. Do you understand? <laughs> Why should I believe that you're any better than those men? I have nothing in common with these people. The only person I have something in common with is you. Well, we're staying in France there, and also it's another literary uh, mystery here, if you like. The next new release is An Homme Ideal, or A Perfect Man. The model of perfection himself is played by Pierre Ninet, the French actor, but I get the feeling that he's revealed to be less than perfect in this film. Uh, you can say that again. Pierre Ninet, of course, was one of the youngest actors ever admitted to the permanent troupe of the Comédie Française, uh, and he uh, recently won the Best Actor César for his astonishing performance as Yves Saint Laurent in, uh, in the film um, about him. Um, here he plays one Mathieu Vasseur, and Mathieu longs to be a published novelist, but he has no talent. Uh, <laughs> His manuscript is rejected everywhere, so to make a living he's forced to uh, work for a moving company that empties out the houses of people who have no heirs, and while he's doing that he comes across uh, a manuscript in a leather-bound uh, uh, notebook, which is, the, uh, which is the, the writings of a man who was fighting for the French in Algeria in the early 1960s. So Matthew uh, takes the manuscript, retypes it, presents it as its own, it's accepted by a major publisher, is an incredible success, he is an overnight success. He is catapulted to fame, and uh, authors in France are treated no different than royalty. We meet up with him again three years later when he's in a, a wonderful family, and um, things start to go terribly wrong because somebody seems to know that he didn't really read the book. <laughs> well, it all hinges again on literary buried treasure. Now, 
Finally, we're taking a look back to a modern classic from Christopher Nolan. This director is better known today for these big blockbusters like Interstellar, but 15 years ago he made Memento, that film that messed with our memories. <laughs> this is getting a re-release now here in France. It is, and to say that it's non-linear and that the uh, narrator is unreliable would be an enormous understatement. Guy Pearce plays Leonard, a man who's living in a motel, and he suffers from um, a severe form of short-term memory impairment. He remembers everything that happened to him before the night his wife was raped and murdered and he was hit on the head, but he can't get any new memories to stick. So he has to rely on Polaroid photos with notes on them. The most important facts he has actually tattooed on his body and he rediscovers them every day in the mirror looking down. He's out to get revenge for his wife's death, but the ironic thing is if he does accomplish that, he won't remember it uh, a minute later. The film has spun with genre traditions like the chase scene because he doesn't know whether he's being chased or he's doing the chasing. Um, it's it's a, a very, very worthwhile film. One to revisit then, perhaps. Well, that's all we've got time for. Thanks, Lisa, for being with us. And thanks to you at home for watching. Remember, you can get more culture news on our website. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. We'll leave you with a clip from Memento. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. My wife deserves vengeance. It doesn't make any difference whether I know about it. Just because there are things I don't remember doesn't make my actions meaningless. What have I done? Come on, Leonard. How many times I gotta tell you? It's not safe for you to hang around here anymore. Why not? Because the cops looking for you. You're gonna pay for it. You know, I've had more rewarding friendships than this one. Although I do get to keep telling the same joke.